This isn't my story. It happened to a friend of mine, and with his permission, I'll recount it here as he told it to me. Basically, in early 2010s, I was going to a small community college and had a lot of spare time on my hands. I decided to start a TTRPG club using D&D 4th Edition. The college had these multi-purpose rooms you could book for free if you were a club. I posted some flyers, and before long, had a pretty regular group. One night, I was getting set up and had some of my regulars, plus a few friends they invited. The session involved the PCs speaking to some lord about a cult they discovered. Before we get started, I go to use the washroom. It takes a few minutes, since it's a long walk. I get back and suddenly the group is really aggro. Insulting the guards, demanding things from the lord, things escalate, and a fight breaks out. As I'm rolling initiative, I say, damn, why are you guys so aggro all of a sudden? Did you all do a line of coke while I was in the washroom or something? I expected chuckles, but instead there was this long, awkward silence and nervous looks. Finally, I ask, wait, did you all do a line of coke while I was in the washroom? So yes, turns out that while I was out of the room, one of the guest players had offered some drugs to the table, and everyone indulged. I ended the game and left. Never continued with it since I didn't want to risk getting in trouble with the college. Kind of flocked up that they didn't share with the DM, just saying. But I've never really associated coke with D&D, it's more of a pot or drinking kind of game. Cult Divinity Lost? World of Darkness? Now those are coke games. You can't convince me that the guy who wrote a whole story about how his game is cursed at the end of one of his books wasn't on something. I would sooner believe that Stephen King wrote it when he was sober. Anyway, my name is Jacob Crow and welcome to The Crow's Perch, where each week we dive into RPG horror stories, each more terrifying than the last. And so, without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive into this week's stories. To start off, I'm not a monster. I felt bad she, we'll call her Paladin, got so upset over this encounter, but I couldn't stretch my empathy far enough to care that much. This is an old story that I just remembered today. So here's the context. I, as a teenager, was in a local D&D campaign with some older college friends. We all met in high school, so it wasn't that far off of age differences. We only met on Sundays for a session of D&D, and some lunch every week. So at this point, we were all friends, but we weren't nearly as close as we once were. One of my friends brought Paladin at the start of the campaign, whom he met at his college. She was chill, but clearly enjoyed spending time with the boys more than trying to befriend me. But I didn't care. It was nice to not be the only girl in the group. This story happens about three months into the campaign. This campaign was very heavy with roleplay, which I was not used to. So I had many long discussions with the DM about my character. To sum it up, she was a tiefling whose dad didn't like her for that reason. However, she always tried to win over his approval. Well, it was revealed in the campaign that her dad was doing evil things in town. So the party had a discussion about what to do. It was clear from talking with the DM and set up of session that this was going to be a big moment for my character. So while formulating our plan, my character said she wanted to try and talk with her father, believing he can still be good. If that doesn't work, then she wants to be the one to end him, getting closure for her years of torment. The party agreed and formulated a plan where they would wait to ambush him if the discussion goes wrong, and everyone was on board and excited. That is when Paladin spoke up. For a little more context, she was a bit of a Mary Sue, and always tried to be the main character. The rest of the party knew this, so we typically didn't pay it any mind and just let her do whatever. In response to my character saying she wanted to be the one to end her father, she said, No. I will do it. He threatened my friends, and therefore, he will die. The problem this time is this was the buildup of my character's entire backstory. It wouldn't make sense for her to do that. My character explained again that she wanted to talk with him first. Even with everything going on, it was her father, and she still had faith in him. Paladin got heated and stood her ground, and said that she won't let any talking happen. She will just kill him. So I responded with the only response I thought made sense for my character, which calmly was, If you kill my father, 
I will never forgive you. The party, in-game, agrees that this was something my character needed to do. All of this back and forth happened strictly in-game. We finished our plan, everything seemed normal, and the DM called it for some lunch. Paladin seemed fine and walked away while we were cleaning up the table. We just assumed she needed the restroom or something. But we heard the front door slam. One of the boys walked over to see if she just left. It was unusual, because she was just acting perfectly normal, but didn't say anything as she left. We were trying to remember if she said she couldn't stay for lunch. That is when we heard the boys say, Oh my god, what happened? Are you okay? We all rushed to the door to see her sitting on the ground sobbing. We have no idea what's going on and bring her inside to see if she's okay. We are asking her if she fell, if she hurt herself, or if she got bad news. All the while, she's not responding, just sobbing. That's when she finally yells, You all hate me, especially OP. OP hates me. To say we were confused by this 180 is an understatement. Throughout her sobs, she tells us that everyone hated her plan for next session, her killing my character's father, and therefore, we all hate her. We try to reassure her that it's just a game, but she was persistent. Some of my other friends suggested I go home to give her some space. It wasn't her house either, but I did. Looking back, pretty sure she just didn't want me hanging out anymore. The campaign ended two sessions later with a TPK, and our DM said he was done with D&D. So, we stopped meeting up. I understand if the combat just happens to resolve a certain way, or the paladin gets the final blow or something. And if that were the case, I guess that's just the way the tragic backstory cookie crumbles. But even then, for me personally at least, I would try to go for the knockout. So at least that way, their character would have a chance to make the final decision on their father's fate. Look, it's one thing to have main character syndrome and prioritize your screen time over the rest of the party, but it's a whole nother thing entirely to then throw such a massive tantrum over it. To the point to where it literally destroyed the group. The level of entitlement to throw a hissy fit over resolving someone else's backstory is absolutely insane. And while I can't say for the DM, I truly hope that it hasn't destroyed the rest of the party's desire to play D&D for good. I just sat for five and a half hours. Not the worst, but I am so tired. A game of Vampire the Masquerade. Yes, yes, this is horror in itself. Five and a half hours, during which I did nothing. The game was dedicated to removing the Striga curse from a party member. At first, we just walked and talked about how to remove the curse, and my character was mostly silent. And then the master played for two hours only with the cursed person. First, a conversation. It started in a circle four times, then lifting the curse, and then talking again. The other five people just sat and listened. One actually fell asleep. There wasn't even internet there, because it was in the basement of a garage. And it was pretty cold. Why did I even come to this party, huh? Well, at least you admit your first mistake was playing Vampire the Masquerade. <laughs> well, don't worry. It could always be worse. You could have been playing Shadowrun, rules is written. This story happened at a con this spring. That particular con had several horror stories that I might share later. It's not as serious as some other con horror stories I've read here. It was more of a waste of time. But I think it's a good example of how not to run Blade Runner. Or any games. I love Free League's Blade Runner. I've played the starter box adventure and then ran it myself a couple times. Every time an absolute blast. It's just so ripe with atmosphere and facilitates deep role-playing really well. But it still is the only officially published adventure. So I was excited to see that someone was running their own scenarios. It was a late night game, scheduled to run from 8 p.m. to about 1 to 2 a.m. I was super tired, but pumped. The GM told us that he was a huge Blade Runner fan, knew both movies by heart, watched the anime series, all the supplemental materials. He said that he wanted us to create characters from scratch, even though it eats the game time. 
because he didn't want to railroad us, and said that we would be completely free to do whatever in his game, and that he would adapt our backstories to make sure they came up in play. Fantastic. I make a classic too old for this shit human veteran Blade Runner. We start the game. It goes well at first. A very interesting mystery about a dead replicant. We go and investigate. Look for clues. The replicant in question was apparently a billionaire and very powerful. Which was bizarre, but okay, whatever. Then we find a talking AI fridge that had a very bubbly personality and a few other AI appliances, which broke my immersion because, come on, is this the same setting? But whatever, author's interpretation. I decided to roll with it. Things get weirder. When I try to roleplay and talk to some of the witnesses and dead replicant's girlfriend, when the GM says that there is no point in doing it, because they don't know anything. I tried to suggest a few other scenes where my detective could do some detective work, and the GM just says, You don't find anything there. I ask if I can roll investigate, and he says, No, I will roll for you. Every time one of the players tried to look for clues or make a skill check, he would roll one dice, which is not how skill checks are done in this game, and say, No, you don't find anything. We spend an hour doing this. Then the GM fast forwards a week and tells us that there was another dead replicant. We go to the murder scene. And again, there is zero investigating. Zero roleplay. He just rolled a die for our every question and then said, You don't find anything there. Whenever I tried to do some roleplay by talking to NPCs or anything like that, the GM said you don't learn anything from this conversation. The party feels completely lost, and the GM fast-forwards again to another murder, and we do the exact same thing. At this point, it feels like a very bad point-and-click quest, where we would just go through motions. What about this, or that? And the GM would roll a die and say, No. Again, zero roleplay, zero hooks. I stopped even looking at my character sheet. Because in four hours, I made one skill check at the beginning, and none of my backstory ever came up. We weren't playing characters, we were just making guesses, and he was just answering no, or yes, but mostly no, after rolling the same one die behind his screen. He used none of the game mechanics, and didn't let us use them either. At that point, I just wanted to leave, but I still wanted to know who was the killer because the mystery itself was actually not that bad. It's just that we had zero agency, and we weren't actually playing the game. At around 2 a.m., we decided to end the game, because everyone was frustrated and falling asleep, and we made zero progress in the case. The GM took our contacts, promised to schedule a follow-up session, and that was the last I heard from him, which is okay with me, but I am still frustrated to not know the answer. It was the butler. If you have to ask, it was the butler. And if it wasn't the butler before, the GM is now writing down that it was in fact the butler. I've played in a lot of investigations, more so than I have in dungeon crawls, and I can confidently say that the worst possible thing you can do to players during an investigation is to give them a crime scene with no information. You look lonely. When I flip over a rock, tell me what's under it. I see a dead body, tell me what the stab wounds look like. Don't tell me, oh, it's hard to tell, and make me roll an investigation check. If I'm playing a goddamn rogue, I should be able to know what a f***ing knife looks like when it's put in someone's body, as it is safe to say I have some first-hand experience on how that works. I say all this because this horror story reminds me of a weird tendency I've personally witnessed from several GMs sometimes not even from newer ones, to withhold information even if it's completely worthless, or to gate really obvious information behind skill checks. And let me tell you right now that if you're running a game focused on investigation, you need to tell your party as much about a crime scene as you can. And if it leads them to bad information, that still works. Even bad information is good information because even a bad lead is actionable information. Anyway, if you enjoyed this rant, subscribe to the channel. If you want
to subscribe? Subscribe. You want to subscribe? Subscribe. You like subscribing? Subscribe. Your family's life is in danger if you don't subscribe. <sighs> this is a very light story compared to others on the subreddit. Just a funny thing that happened to me a few years ago. I'd like to tell you about Marco. I'd known Marco for many years when this story took place. A fairly pleasant person, albeit a bit elitist and a little lazy. Over the years, I had noticed some peculiarities about him related to TTRPGs. Marco thinks that Warhammer Fantasy is the perfect game with the most beautiful lore of all, but he never found anyone to play it with, for reasons that might become clear shortly. However, he has read many books and manuals about the setting, his favorites being the Gotrek and Felix saga, which I'm not familiar with, never read, and can't remember, despite him telling me about them. Marco considers the World of Darkness setting too simplistic, and for years, he tried to create characters and situations that would break the game system, never succeeding. Note that this didn't happen at the gaming table. He simply invented his very unique OC vampires, which turned out to be quite ordinary in reality. He told me that he had written several D&D classes, but I've never seen one, and I've never seen him play D&D. Marco apparently doesn't grasp the concept of serious gaming. For him, role-playing should primarily have humorous elements, an excuse to get together and goof around. He still talks about campaigns or one-shots played more than a decade ago that lasted a few sessions, and I was present in four of them, and they were horror stories in their own right. Marco has an almost total lack of imagination in inventing plots, despite his constant claims of thinking about world-building. As I mentioned, this very short story took place a few years ago, in the winter, in the garden of a seaside house. Four guys around 25 years old, sitting at a table. Lots of alcohol, light drugs, a large meat dinner, and the soothing sound and warmth of the bonfire. We were discussing this and that, mainly anime, manga, and American comics, when Marco, with shining eyes, showed us the game he had brought for the evening, taking a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay manual out of his backpack. I believe it was the third edition. Honestly, the three of us weren't very enthusiastic, personally. I found the setting a bit boring. One guy was completely drunk, another was, well, stoned. But Marco convinced us to create characters, backstories, roll some dice, mainly driven by his declaration that he had prepared an awesome story, and that it might be a campaign. I don't remember what character I created, neither the characters of the other two people, because of what happened as soon as we prepared to play, in the dim light illuminated by the bonfire and the neighbor's lamps. Marco sat at the head of the table and declared with a serious tone, It was the night of Grimmsnatch. No, no, wait, it was the night of a uh, game snatch. No, Griminast? Grimmitch? German act? We all burst into laughter. He constantly tried to repeat that word, which I had never heard before. He tried for about a full three minutes, until one of my two companions literally fell from his chair laughing, and continued to laugh almost to the point of suffocation. By then, we had wasted about two hours making character sheets for player characters we would never play. But damn, did we laugh. For the rest of the night, we heard Marco repeating, Grimace, Genichat, Snitch." I asked him what the plot he was so excited about was, knowing his general lack of imagination. But he didn't want to talk about it. And being the curious person that I am, it bothered me a bit. About three years later, for his birthday, we gave him three or four manuals of the new edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and he promised to write a campaign. I don't think it will ever happen. P.S. Oh, the Heisenberg moment. About a year after this story, I was at Marco's house, and I asked to use the bathroom. I found what looked like a fantasy book on his washing machine, one of the Gotrek and Felix series. I believe it was called Blood of Demons, but I'm not sure. I opened it to a random page and read, it was the night of Geheimenschnacht Eve. Damn. It is very hard for me to take a DM seriously if they go on to say that the World of Darkness setting is too simplistic. It is anything but simplistic, and its politics are incredibly difficult to follow, especially for new players. But 
to be as fair as possible to this DM. Yeah, that word took me like five different tries. About a decade or so ago, my wife and I scraped together an RPG group in a small Midwestern town. We drew in people from several counties, and often provided transport for the majority of the players. We lived in the largest town in the area, but there was no real bus or mass transit service. Although we had a dearth of players, we had a surplus of GMs. Everyone had a different system they wanted to play and run, so we settled on a round-robin GMing style. Every three to five weeks, it was a weekly game night. A new player would game master. Some were better than others. We tried to give everyone a break. Until Cthulhu Pants. Cthulhu Pants was an oddball. Coming from money, his dad was a retired government muckety-muck, his mom was an inventor of something, and voicing bizarre opinions that came from confused recollections of childhood friends around the globe, such as, No one deserves happiness. The truth behind cancer is the confusion of the mind-cell network. That kind of thing. It was always hard to tell if he was a broken kid or a masterful troll. Perhaps both. He ran an awful game based on the Slayer's anime franchise, with too many naughty jokes and no adventure whatsoever. He ran an awful game based on Neon Genesis Evangelion, in which all of the NPCs were basically cardboard cutouts that repeated one phrase over and over again, no matter what question you asked them. But his crowning achievement was why we called him Cthulhu Pants. He ran the same scenario for us, the one you find in the back of every edition of Call of Cthulhu, from first to fifth, the haunted house, five times in a row. You know the one. There's a creepy house with a telekinetic vampire named Corbett in the basement. Things float around. The upstairs bedroom beats up investigators. About halfway through, a minor horror from another dimension jumps out of the cupboard. Two GMs had read this scenario, and three of us had played it. I had both read and played the scenario. We warned Cthulhu Pants that most of us knew what happened in this adventure, and he might want to switch things up a bit. The only player in the group who had no experience with this particular adventure, a lovely young lady from the community college, couldn't show up that evening. He didn't change a thing. Everything was exactly where it was in the scenario in the book. We really tried not to go directly to where the main antagonist was hidden, behind a panel in the basement. We put up with some poltergeist hijinks and lost a few points of sanity, just to get the thing over with. Call it a speedrun, where we tried to make it look like it wasn't a speedrun. I think we did okay. The next week, it was still Cthulhu Pants Go as a GM. The player who missed last session showed up and made a Cthulhu Investigator. At which point, Cthulhu Pants said that he would run the adventure again, since she had missed last session. Cthulhu Pants had a little crush on this girl. She got married to someone else less than a year later. We groaned, and asked if maybe Cthulhu Pants could run one of the other adventures out of the basic Cthulhu book. We'd read those too, and we thought speedrunning all the basic adventures might be worthwhile. But no. Cthulhu Pants insisted on doing the same one again, so I said I'd like to try something now, and play the game more like a character in a horror movie, by which I meant stupidly oblivious to danger and stubbornly insistent nothing supernatural could ever happen. My character survived. The one girl who'd never played didn't. The next week, Cthulhu Pants handed around a character sheet on how to play Call of Cthulhu which irritated all of us, including the one girl who hadn't, not only because it came from the basic book, but because we were all horror movie fans. Then he ran us through the same scenario again. This time, we all played horror movie characters. We did every horror movie shtick we could think of, from walking through the house calling for each other, to bringing inappropriate clothing and supplies, to avoiding the basement, where we knew the actual monster we had to kill to end the scenario, lay helpless, waiting for our wooden stakes or whatever, at all costs. I survived again. The girl Cthulhu Pants had a crush on did not. So, 
the next week, Cthulhu Pants said he would give us one more chance to solve the adventure. This time, we sold tickets to the haunted house and invited the elite of Arkham County Society to a demonstration of actual ghost activity. The girl Cthulhu Pants lusted after had a wonderful time luring the upper crust, mock innocently, to their doom. Most of them got eaten by the Dimensional Shambler. This time, she survived. I didn't. The next week was Cthulhu Pants' last chance to run a game before GMs rotated. We sat with bated breath because we knew, oh, we knew what was coming. We had side bets on whether he realized what he was doing or whether he thought we were generally bad at a game that so many of us had played several times before, usually at conventions. He'd already admitted that he didn't watch as many horror movies as we did. The girl he liked was a huge horror buff. She had the best collection of Clive Barker novels in the county. So, he set us down for our Cthulhu final, as he put it, and said we were running something called Terror in Boston, but it was the Corbett house again. He even used the same introductory patter, with the names slightly changed. He didn't bother to change the vampire's name. Our player characters set the house on fire in the game, without bothering to go inside, waited for the 1930s authorities, and told him he wasn't allowed to GM Call of Cthulhu anymore. His next turn at GM, he ran a cult divinity loss game that was just as terrible and lacking in horror thrills as you might expect. But at least it wasn't the haunted house. Very rarely do I laugh out loud reading one of these horror stories, but I had to pause a couple times because it was just not so good. This is the definition of insanity. Running the same adventure that everyone already knows about over and over again, expecting different results. Now I understand running Keep on the Borderlands for the millionth time, but there are only so many outcomes in the haunted house, or in any linear adventure for that matter, that I'd have to believe that this GM is either a grandmaster troll or a flocking idiot. But honestly, it's probably both. But hey, we made it to the end of today's stories, and if you like today's stories, be sure to support the channel by liking this video and subscribing to the channel. And if you made it this far, why not leave a comment, or sign up on the Crow's Perch Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Can't think of a comment? Then leave the comment, Haunted House, so I know you made it to the end of today's stories. And I'll see you next time. As the Crow Flies